I've known Gary for a number of years and, and spent time with him in a number of situations. He's about the most interesting pe person you ever want to meet. Uh, he's a guy that gets stuff done. And it's, it's just, he's very competitive, just little things. If you're going into a, um, a bar or something, he sure likes to play skeet, ball, or pool, or anything else, and he'll make sure that he wins. And no matter how hard you try, he's gonna try a little bit harder. Governor Johnson, I think, represents a, a new way of thinking about America, which is at the same time a hearkening back to the greatness that America is. So Gary Johnson is a self-made man. He, struck, he created a, a ma and pa shop in New Mexico, turned into the largest construction company in New Mexico. I look to the future of employees, and what I tell everyone is that they should become their own entrepreneur. I encourage everyone to be an entrepreneur within my business. You come up with a great idea, I'd like to bankroll it, I'll give you a third of the profits, uh, and you don't have to put out the money. I'll put out the money. You can fulfill all of your ambitions uh, career-wise within this company. I have had thousands of employees. Uh, I'm sure you could get the big range of, uh, of uh, opinions on that. But I think that for the most part, uh, it would be favorable, that this was somebody who was very fair. Sharing in the profits, remarkable things happen. You're not taking a smaller piece of the same size pie, you're taking a smaller piece of a much bigger pie. When everybody's pulling in the same direction, it's magic. I learned that there is nothing easier in life than hiring somebody. And you only hire the best people. You do make mistakes, and whether or not it's you making a mistake or them making a mistake. They took the job, it's not working out, and they've got to be fired. And there's nothing more difficult than firing a person. So in 2012, when Mitt Romney said, I love firing people, my response to that is, I hate firing people. Um, he was told it was impossible for him to be elected governor of New Mexico. Well, he proved him wrong and won the governorship in New Mexico. This was 1994. My momentum was like this, and my opponents were flatlined. And we figured that I was going to pass them basically on election day, primary election day. Very early on, after the uh, results started coming in, all of a sudden, I am down 20,000 votes that I'm not supposed to be. And we huddle up and come to grips with the fact that I lost the primary. Well, this is very, very early in the evening. And we make a decision, I make a decision, that I'm going to go down on the floor and I'm going to have fun. So I go down and the first interview is KOAT, Channel 7. Gary Johnson, everybody was expecting you to put up this great fight and there was an expectation that you might have won tonight. Clearly, you're not going to win. Um, what do you got to say? Well, then Channel 13, they interview me. It's neck and neck. I mean, you've got to be excited. You've created this, you've created this excitement in New Mexico and this is just, this is going to go down to the wire. And what, what do you think? And I'm thinking, you know, KOAT has already got this nailed. I've lost the race. And you guys are just behind where they're at. Then the next channel gets on, channel four. It's neck and neck, man. You've got to be excited. You know that you, you've brought excitement to this stage that hasn't been seen. So... After I get these three rapid-fire interviews going down early and standing back, I start looking at the boards. And KOAT is reporting 20,000 more votes for my opponent than, any, than either of the other stations. So I asked Channel 4, how far are you behind your reporting from KOAT? We're not behind them at all. We have, this, we have the same data, we report at the same time. 
I go to channel 13, I ask the same question. How far are you behind KOAT? We're not behind them at all. So all of a sudden, I got this 20,000 vote imbalance. And KOAT, by the way, is continuing to broadcast the fact that Gary Johnson's out of it and Dick Cheney appears as though he's going to be the winner. I'm watching all this transpire. And then, sure enough, KOAT comes back to me. Come on, um, are you going to concede? Because clearly, you're going to lose. And I said, I may end up losing this election, but right now, you guys have got your numbers wrong. Dick Cheney is met in the hallway by a, by a KOAT representative saying, we've made a mistake. And then for the first time, I go ahead on all three boards. And all three boards are identical. The place just goes crazy. More than half of Albuquerque went to bed at 10.30 uh, believing that, uh, that Dick Cheney had won the race. And the next morning, you know, I, I, had, I had ended up winning. John. And, to the, and one of my buddies that was on the Denali trip I was talking to you earlier about going and climbing the uh, shield in, uh, in uh, it's not the shield, the knife edge. It's one thing to walk on the eight inch curb, you know, great balance, but what if it's, what if it's across the top of that, you know? And that's what the knife edge is like. Yes, yeah. you got you 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 got you got three points on the rock. You got two hands. You got two feet on the rock. You're not slipping. And yes, you can you can make your way along this traverse. But off the backside is 1,600 feet. There were three places on this knife three places on this knife edge where you were in a position that if you would have slipped, you'd have, you'd have been dead. Rock climbing, for me, changed my life. I mean, there was an immediacy to rock climbing, there was an in the now to rock climbing. And for me, I, I needed to be as good as I could possibly be. I needed to be the best that I could be. And uh, although I never had a drinking problem, you know, a, a drink in the evening, a couple drinks in the evening for me, made it harder to get up in the morning, just a little bit. So, but that was the, that was the reason. Had taken up rock climbing and just wanted to be as good as I possibly could be. And I thought that alcohol got in the way of that. And 28 years later, I think it's the best decision health-wise that I've made for myself. And Kate asked about when we, we had our relationship talk, Kate said, well, you don't drink. And I do, and I said, I don't care if you drink yourself into oblivion every night, it's okay with me. She doesn't by any means. Kate's the healthiest person I know. Kate is the queen of moderation. You know who the most frugal person in the entire world is? I love her for it. Kate Prusa. <laughs> There's a big difference though between frugal and cheap. We are not cheap, but we are frugal. That's right. <laughs> That's Elbrus. It's my son and daughter. Son and daughter and Elbrus. Russia. Highest mountain in Europe. Summit of Everest. It's on the way to the summit of Everest. That's through the ice fall. And then you can see how we got there. Looks pretty hairy, doesn't it? And that's the way that I came down. And when I got when I got back to this point right over here, 
that's when I realized that my oxygen had been turned off for two and a half hours, and that's the rubber mask I had on. This is my airplane that I had. I was flying that. My son was also in the plane. This is who he is. It's not, it's not like he has to create a different person. Everything he says is who he is. It's always been that way. That's Gary. Well, I, I've always said that the, the, the tax revenue generated by legalizing pot gets dwarfed by the savings in law enforcement, the courts, and the prisons. Well, without a question, and it, and it cost the society uh, oh. the war on oh. drugs is disastrous. Yes. Well, when you consider now that there are probably 20 million convicted felons in this country because of drug laws, that, but for our drug laws would not be, would otherwise be tax-paying, law-abiding well, citizens. Not to mention the havoc on the streets of America caused yeah, by yeah. Right? Ninety percent of the drug problem is prohibition-related, not use-related. That's not to discount the problems with use and abuse. And what I've, what I've said, though, since 99, is that when we legalize marijuana, and I do say when, everybody's going to undergo a transformation when it comes to other drugs. And it'll start with decriminalization. I have always maintained since 1999 that legalizing marijuana will lead to less overall substance abuse because it's so much safer than everything else that's out there starting with alcohol. And you have now 56% of Americans supporting legalizing pot and no one, no one in, a, in an elected position is advocating that. No one. So when I ran for office uh, in um, 1994 for governor, I um, had smoked marijuana. It was something that I did. And I really detested uh, Bill Clinton and the fact that when he was asked if he smoked marijuana, he said that he didn't inhale. It just wasn't honest. So I was asked by John Robertson of the Journal if I had ever smoked marijuana. And I said that I had. He asked some other questions, some follow-up questions. Well, when I got back to the campaign office, I told everybody what had transpired, and really it was just a general freakout on the part of everybody. Oh, no. Keep in mind, in 1994, no candidate said that they smoked marijuana, and yet 100 million Americans, you know, had uh, statistically smoked marijuana. Well, I was one of them. So the campaign is freaking out. And before I know it, we've got a meeting with the uh, Albuquerque Journal editorial board. And the editorial board wants to know, number one, I think right off the bat, well, are you sorry for your having used marijuana? No, I'm not. It's something that I did, and it's something that a lot of people did. And, brought out the statistic. I'm one of the 100 million Americans who have smoked marijuana. And the next week it came out, the article, and they could not have written it better. They couldn't have written it better. And basically what they did is they just put it out there matter-of-factly. And amazingly, there was no reaction. No reaction. Nobody had anything to say about it. Well, in that campaign, um, I did a ride across New Mexico that I ended up doing for 18 years, which, is, which I called the Trek for Trash, where we bicycled somewhere in the vicinity of 500 miles a year and picked up trash riding across New Mexico on bicycles. So this is the primary, and we're riding across the state picking up trash, and there's a reporter uh, there from... Uh, KOB, Stuart Dyson, and he said, 
So you inhale, huh? And this is really the first reaction that, that I'd gotten. And my response was, back to Bill Clinton, I said, you know what, Stuart, I never exhaled. <laughs> and I thought it was funny, and he thought it was funny, and that aired. And that was the first airing of all this. Well, I'm running against Bruce King, and I'm running against his lieutenant governor running mate, Patricia Madrid. Well, Patricia Madrid comes out, oh gosh, maybe a week later, and you can just, here it is. They, they launched into it. Gary Johnson is irresponsible. Gary Johnson is not a role model. Gary Johnson smokes pot. You know, this is, this is absolutely re 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 reprehensible, the fact that he's representing himself as, uh, as somebody who can potentially be governor, and he's treating this so flippantly. This made news. You could see this was the first salvo in what was going to be several salvos. Well, Stuart Dyson came back to me and he said, well, what do you think about Patricia and what she's got to say? And I said, well, Stuart, to my knowledge, Patricia Madrid was a pothead in, in college. He goes, really? And I go, well, yeah, I mean, too many people have said that to me for that not to be the case. Well, he gets an interview with Patricia Madrid, and he's interviewing Patricia Madrid, and she rails against Gary Johnson and how irresponsible he is and how this is just the wrong message to be sending. And then he asks the question, well, Patricia, have you ever done marijuana? And her reply is, well, yes, but I did it responsibly. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a very funny experience before John Kerry ran for president. My brother Alex and I went to Yale, and so we had something in common to talk to John Kerry about. And this was right before, the summer before he ran for president, uh -huh. before he got the nomination. And I told him that I thought that a huge amount of capital could be released to address more important needs in this country if we completely legalize drugs. He said, you know, I agree, but I would completely lose the nomination if I advocated that. I couldn't possibly advocate that. And I think that's true about the majority of, of people in both parties. Whether they believe it or not, they would never say that they believe it. In 1999, I, w I was the highest ranking elected official to advocate for legalizing marijuana. To this day, no, no sitting member of Congress, the House, or the Senate, or governors has advocated legalizing pot to this day. Not even the governor of Colorado? No. Wow. And, and you have now 56% of Americans supporting legalizing pot, and no one no one in a, an elected position is advocating that. No one. So do you think there's guys that are in there that would stay there forever if they could be? Yes. Well, I tell you what, if there weren't term limits, I might still want to be governor. It, it, was, it was fun. It was, it was stimulating. I mean, what more out of life you know, do you, you want out of life than something? I mean, it was a job that was just enjoyed every minute of it really and enjoyed the worst parts of it too because that involved you know really bringing to bear everything it was that you were dealing with whatever it was and that we dealt with everything straight up and I've done that my whole life I mean I told my cabinet I said first of all if we're in the wrong I want everybody admitting it Fuck the lawyers. Let them catch up with, with the truth. Because ultimately the truth will come out. So let's just deal with it. If, we, if you've made a mistake and it's an egregious mistake, I don't want to hear from the lawyers. I want to hear from you and I want to be public about the fact that we screwed up and this is egregious and here's how it's going to get fixed. 
and you see it all the time where the agency won't give a comment because obviously they're guilty and that we didn't do we didn't do any of that so we there really weren't a, you know crisis i think results from cover up in 2012 uh, i was running as a republican i got to appear in two of the republican national debates the second one i appeared in in florida I made the following comment. My neighbor's two dogs uh, have created more shovel-ready jobs than this administration. I thought I hit a home run in the debate. Uh, after the debate, CNN, which had a debate coming up in two weeks, included me for the first time in their every other week national poll. In that poll, I was tied with uh, Kane. I was ahead of Huntsman. I was ahead of Santorum, and we're thinking that, okay, finally, this whole polling thing is water under the bridge. The issue being that I just wasn't being polled. Well, CNN uh, said that the criteria for the upcoming debate in two weeks, this was a couple days later, was going to be a poll conducted six weeks earlier in which my name wasn't on the poll. And so that's exclusion in a way that goes completely unnoticed by everybody. And that was the last time that my name appeared in their every other week national poll. Exclusion in a way that just goes completely unnoticed by everybody. People per perceive the Presidential Debate Committee as a government entity, and it's not. And I think... I think the whole election process needs needs to be reworked, and uh, that's that's the place to start. With the understanding that it's catch twenty two between the polling and the debates. If they don't include Gary in the polling, then of course he can't get to fifteen percent, and you do have to wonder if that's intentional. It seems pretty apparent that it's, it's intentional. And in 2012, if there looked like an opportunity that he might be polling enough to get into the base, they would make up something that we termed the Johnson rule, that they would exclude him happened more than once. I've not personally um, gotten a call from a pollster, but uh, I know people that have, and uh, there was not an option. There was not a Gary Johnson option. Um, the, only, the only answers were Trump or Clinton, or undecided, or not voting. Specifically, um, Gary's son, Eric, got a call and he said, I'm voting for Gary Johnson. And they said, so you're not voting. He said, no, I'm voting for Gary Johnson. He, they said, so you're undecided. He said, no, I'm voting for Gary Johnson. <laughs> that's not an option. That's how it went. So that's how the polls are run. It's very frustrating and it should be frustrating to the American people. I was hiking to uh, Wheeler Peak. This was this summer. And there was a family on the side of the trail. You know, it's a, it's a hard hike. And I asked one of the kids, there was two boys there. And this is really analogous to life. But I, you know, started talking to the two kids and I said, well, how many, how many people do you know that have climbed Mount Everest? And they go, well, I don't know anybody. I said, well, now you know one person, me. And I said, you know what the difference is between climbing Mount Everest and climbing to Wheeler Peak like we're doing right now? What? My answer was nothing. You still got to put, you just put one foot after the other. And yes, it is really hard, but just keep after it. And you know what? If you don't make it, you'll make it next time. 